One thing that we know is, is that uh, it takes a lot of research and a lot of time to kind of figure out what works where. Over the last six years, uh, or, or for the last four or five years, I guess, uh, I've placed over 450 cover crop plots in six different states. Most of these have been small strips. Uh, some of them have been many acres per strip or per different product. And uh, then we try to do root pit digs and try to get a lot of information on what products work well in what uh, areas. Uh, basically, those states would be, uh, I didn't include Ontario in that, so it would be from Ontario uh, and in the eastern Corn Belt and then up into uh, the upper Midwest as well. Uh, so we can get a lot of different opportunities to look at different products and how they work. We will let Gail and, and Keith talk about what happens elsewhere uh, as we go further west. Uh, when we're looking at different cover crops, uh, again, producing nitrogen is one of the benefits that we're going to get from that. Several legumes make good cover crops. And again, how much nitrogen that they will produce, and the answer to that is it depends. And I get that asked that question often. It's like, can I stop putting on nitrogen on my corn? No. How long have you used cover crops? And what is the cover crop you're using? And the answer is always no, but, but uh, still we wanted everyone to have success and not lose yield until you get to the guys that have been doing it 25, 30 years and get to that spot. One thing we know when we're looking at legume cover crops is we really need to be looking at inoculating our legumes every year. Um, I was talking with someone from North Carolina just a little while ago and she said, well, you know, we don't need to inoculate our hairy vetch, but I'll tell you, when the Eastern Corn Belt and when we're planting peas or planting um, uh, crimson clover, or planting some different crops that are normally not in a normal corn bean rotation, if we don't inoculate them, we'll see this type of result here. We'll see real nice dark green plants, tall, lush, and then we'll see others that are nice and yellow right beside it and uh, without that growth and obviously not doing a lot of fixing of nitrogen. This is up in Wisconsin at the Badger Plots. It's uh, kind of uh, west, east of uh, Madison. You can see here just some of the uh, nodulation that we were getting on the Austrian winter peas. And the real key here was, was that you know, whenever we're putting out anything in plots, we make sure folks do that. And I always recommend we do it regardless. And there, most of the legumes that are sold are pre-inoculated, or I should say many of them are. But then again, some of them, especially the peas, are normally not sold pre-inoculated. So that'll have to be done by the farmer in the box. Uh, this is just an example of some uh, different uh, two plants. They were side by side. Uh, the guy inoculated them in the box and we had a, almost no inoculant on the pea here on the uh, right and on the left there was good nodulation so that it actually had enough inoculant on that actual pea to help it to inodulate well. And you can see the difference in the color there and if you would have seen the whole picture the difference in the height of the peas was just about a foot difference in height and certainly better color and so forth. When we're talking about Austrian winter peas, this will be one of the key products that can be utilized in many situations, especially after wheat uh, or after other cereal grains. It, it, we really are looking at needing to inoculate this, so if we're looking at flying on cover crops or dropping them in with a high boy type seeder, this is really not our best option. It can work, but not as consistently. Uh, in most areas, it generally will winter kill. Uh, it'd be nice to have five to six weeks of good growth on that to be able to get some decent growth. Uh, better, uh, longer is better with peas, and generally if we're harvesting or grazing, we would get one good harvest off of that. But we can produce 70 to 135 units of nitrogen with peas, and that's pretty significant amount of nitrogen that we can get. And again, an advantage and a disadvantage is usually winter kills, because um, sometimes we'd like to see them overwinter, and the good thing is if they do overwinter, they're easy to uh, go ahead and take care of. This up in Marshfield, Wisconsin, after some plots uh, with uh, Jason Cavadini and we were looking at some different products and different peas out there, peas and oats on the left and then straight peas here on the right. Crimson clover, um, I'll go on record, this is national, it's my favorite cover crop. And it's my favorite cover crop because we can produce a whole lot of nitrogen in a short time period. Uh, it's, it's usually going to winter kill, but last year we found up in Green Bay, Wisconsin where we were finding crimson clover surviving the winter. So will it do that every year? No. Did it last year? Yes. Will it hopefully this year? Yes. But we can't guarantee that it will. But we can produce up to 140 units of nitrogen 
uh, within a few months uh, of following wheat. So 90 days after following wheat, we've been able to measure up to 140 units of nitrogen. Earthworms love crimson clover. And I don't know why they love it more than they love some of the other clovers and more than they love peas, but we find a lot more earthworms there. And then again, it's easy to kill. This is a picture from a friend of mine uh, uh, named Dave Chance. From, he's around Lebanon, Indiana, between Lafayette and, and, uh, and Indianapolis. And this was in his crimson clover field, and he just got an absolutely phenomenal stand. This had had radishes with it, but um, it uh, really just created a, a beautiful situation for him. Field peas, now these will be a little less winter hardy than the Austrian winter peas are going to be. They won't grow quite as late into the fall as what we would see with the Austrian winter peas. Normally we'll never overwinter north of Interstate 70, or at least very rarely would they. They will produce a little bit less nitrogen just because we don't get quite as much growth. And, and so 60 to 120 units of N uh, can make excellent forage, very short, a good short-term cover crop as well, good for weed control. Cowpea, um, you know, in some parts of the country, this is a really awesome cover crop. In others, it's less so. It's more like a summer soybean. So if we can get them established, we've got good moisture and so forth, we can get a real nice stand on these, but they need that warmer soil. They are a summer legume. Uh, seed cost is generally an issue. Seed availability is oftentimes an issue. Uh, we can't harvest the grain like you would on the uh, soybeans, but again, we can get 60 to 120 units of in produced more reliable in summer production than what soybeans are going to be. Medium red clover, probably the least cost uh, cover crop. If you're from Ontario, yes, it can work there. Uh, even though every time I'm in Ontario, I hear that they can't grow medium red clover there because their wheat's so good. But right across the, uh, uh, right across the area in Michigan, there's beautiful stands of medium red clover in 120 plus bushel and acre wheat. So, one thing I've seen with medium red clover, it's rarely this happens, but it might get up too tall in the wheat uh, to affect the harvest. So it'd be more like a, a forage and grain harvest at the same time. That's never fun. But we can produce significant amounts of nitrogen with this, a good root build, uh, system, a uh, good soil builder. Often our least cost cover crop, again, is it's something we can frost seed starting here relatively soon. Uh, well, once the three foot of snow has gone, uh, easily killed and excellent for forage. And I need to understand there's not three foot of snow out there and it's 60 degrees. So after this presentation, go out and sun yourself. Okay, alcite clover. Uh, seed cost is uh, generally a little higher than the medium red clover. Uh, not as good for forage uh, as some of the other clovers. Good okay for cattle, not so good for horses. So we got to be careful how we're using our forage. Again, a very good um, nitrogen producer. Lower growing than the medium red clover is going to be. Does very well in the wetter soil. So if you've got a, a, a situation where you want to frost seed this in to, uh, to wheat and you've got some lower areas, um, this maybe be one that'd be a little more productive in those areas. So a medium red alcyc mixture might not be a bad mix to use as well. Verseem clover is one that has a pretty short growing season. It'll die when it sniffs at a frost, and uh, that's something that's a good and bad depending on whether you want it to live. Seed cost is generally pretty expensive if we're going to be using this by itself. So it's not one of your lower cost uh, legumes, but at the same time, it's one that can give us a fairly good amount of nitrogen. Up to 125 units of N in 60 days, possibly used between wheat and another fall crop. That gives us an option. We can also harvest this for forage, can make excellent for forage, excellent forage. So one thing about Bersim that I learned a lot about this last year in Prevent Plant Acres over in, um, in Minnesota, up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, was the fact that it does not have a real deep root system. So it needs a little more moisture than what we would see on some of our other cover crops. Makes a good cover crop, makes an excellent forage, but does not have the depth of root. On Crimson Clover, we found roots 34 inches deep. On, on clover that's two inches tall. So, I mean, it's a real massive root producer. You won't find that with Bersim clover. Yellow blossom sweet clover is a very good uh, clover as well. Excellent soil builder, maybe one of the best soil builders. But there's only one big monster problem with sweet clover. It's a host to soybean cyst nematode. So if you have soybeans in your rotation, uh, choose not to use this. If you're going corn after corn for the next 20 years, think about it. But, you know, it's not something that we put back in rotations anymore. So most, uh, most folks have pulled this out of the rotation just because of the soybean cyst nematode problems. Then we're going to look at hairy vetch. Hairy vetch uh, is uh, a tremendous uh, producer of, of nitrogen. 
very good soil builder. Most of the nitrogen is going to be found in the top growth. Again, it's not a super deep rooting pro, uh, species, but it, it also has an issue that, uh, although I'm learning there's some, uh, maybe some less hard seed in some of the different uh, vetches that are coming out, hairy vetches. So, but if you're used to using old variety not stated hairy vetch, there can be some problems with hard seed. Make sure and write in your will that you used hairy vetch <laughs> one year. So, okay. Chickling vetch, just again, real quickly, it's, a, it's one that's a little more costly. You'll need to plant this two to three inches deep. You want to plant it about 50 pounds per acre. And again, this would be by itself. And again, but it can produce a lot of nitrogen, up to 200 units of N. 50% um, of the N is reportedly available for the following crop. It's one that's really got a lot of uh, promise and benefit. If we can get uh, more seed production, get the seed cost down, I think that could be beneficial to us as well. Another one has kind of made the press over the last few uh, years or last few months, especially Keith sent me this photo, but sun hemp uh, can produce up to 120 units of N. It's a summer legume, plant about nine weeks before a killing frost. Some years it's pretty expensive. There seems to be a better seed supply over the last couple of years than what there had been. So uh, that's one that also has some potential uh, to be used. And this one, actually, I've seen it work better in mixes than by itself in most areas. Keith also uh, sent some information on mung beans, and I'm sure that's real popular in all of your areas. But it's one that was interesting, and I wanted to say mung bean during this presentation. Uh, it is hard to find. Uh, so it's used for sprouting, smaller seed size, uh, excellent heat and drought tolerance. And that's why I wanted to include it here, because just like the cow pea, it's going to have some excellent drought and heat tolerance. So that's very good, and it's a good nitrogen fixer as well. Can be hazed, hay and grazed, and then we need to use a peanut inoculant instead of what we would typically use on a, on a, on a bean or on a pea. Uh, nitrogen scavengers, uh, I scavenged this picture off the internet. Uh, unfortunately, I've never seen them look quite like that. But uh, with nitrogen scavengers, uh, usually they're not too shy. Um, they're more like the guy on the left. All right. One thing about radishes and peas, uh, we find that they're excellent. And when we're using those with um, cover crops and manure, uh, radish and peas can work real well. You can see in this field the undulation of the different... Uh, you can see the guy that spread the manure wasn't doing a real good job, okay? So we can see that real easily when we're looking at using scavengers. We know that uh, turnips are an excellent scavenger as well. And, and there's not a lot of money spent on advertising turnips. Uh, so therefore, we don't think about turnips a whole lot uh, when we're looking at cover crops. But turnips have very similar uh, scavenging abilities as what radish uh, would. And if we're using the right turnips, we have a lot of soil activity as well. So that's something that can be very beneficial. Uh, this is after hog manure. And again, you can see the strips where we have our annual ryegrass and turnips. And you can see exactly where they put down the uh, hog manure on that field. One, this, uh, I hope you can see this all right. It looks great on my screen. But you can see the difference in the radishes where we have nitrogen versus very little, if any, nitrogen. Uh, so away from the road, they didn't put on the manure. But what a difference that we can see when we're scavenging nitrogen. I did some work a few years ago uh, over in Ohio, Ashland County, Ohio, at a dairy farm. Actually, I had Eileen uh, help me on this, and also Practical Farmers of Iowa helped me. I did the collection of the products, and we sent the uh, radishes up to, um, up to Ames to be able to get tested. And what we found was, and I did not test the cereal rye, and I did not test the oats while they were still living, um, but what I found was I just took uh, uh, some of the radishes out of three square foot areas, and I did that in multiple areas, and I then sent those off for testing. And what we found was we were collecting about 225 units of N when we were close to the barn, and we were scavenging about 168 units of N when we were further away. So there was a whole lot more nitrogen that was put on closer to the barn. Um, and that, again, that was just the radish. That did not include what we were scavenging uh, from the cereal rye or from the oats. So there was a significant amount of that in that was, select, uh, that was kept. On my bottom picture there, you can see quite a slope. And they're putting lots of dairy manure on those slopes, and they're believing that they're getting zero runoff and zero loss of their nitrogen when they're using cover crops on that. And it's pretty amazing that they can put on that much dairy manure on that kind of slope and not get that kind of runoff. So we want to make sure when we're putting on any kind of manure that we're using a scavenger. Another opportunity is uh, 
is using Sudan grasses or sorghum Sudan grasses or milo or a variety of different summer annual grasses, those can also scavenge up to 200 units of N. In this situation, the fellow got 62 inches of growth after 31 days uh, after he'd planted it. That, that makes a phenomenal forage. Uh, he took off four and a half ton dry matter off of that, excellent quality feed and an excellent soil builder as well. So utilizing the sorghum sedans and sudans and milos and so forth also make for great uh, uh, cover crop and also great forage. And I want to show this as well because how much time do I have? Do I still have a moment? Five oh, wow, good. Then I'll, tell you, I'll spend three and a half on this picture. No, I won't. <laughs> One thing I want to show about this picture, it shows both the production and scavenging in the same picture. Now, again, this is not necessarily the radish that you will always get, and this was following wheat, so we had plenty of time. We also had very good moisture, so I want to make that clear. But I want you to look, the, the uh, radish is, is nice and large, which it's a nutrient storage vessel, so it's scavenging lots and lots of nitrogen. But I want you to see how short my crimson clover is behind that photo. My crimson was only about six inches tall, and my radish had tremendous amount of growth there. One thing we want to realize is even if we have short cover crops, especially when we're getting into some of our clovers and so forth, that does not necessarily mean we don't have significant amount of nitrogen production. This had no manure. It had virtually no carryover of, ni carryover of nitrogen where, the, uh, where the, uh, this had been planted or no carryover after the wheat. And it was amazing to me how much nitrogen we can produce in a very short time period with some of these cover crops. We, uh, when we put radishes in a field or, or, or different uh, scavengers in a field, we can tell real quickly whether we have enough nitrogen in that field or not. Just go ahead and plant corn without nitrogen and you can figure out whether you got enough or not. We'll see the same thing with our radishes and our turnips and our different grasses and so forth. So when we're seeing radishes this size, you know you're producing a significant amount of in. My guess is from that small crimson clover and looking at that radish, we probably already produced well over 100 pounds of nitrogen already with that. And again, we've got two things there that earthworms absolutely love. They love the crimson clover, they love the radishes, and if we had turnips out there, we'd find significant amount of, of uh, earthworms around them as well. So again, going further into this, uh, we look at annual ryegrass. Um, I know we're north of Missouri, so it's not a weed, um, uh, and we're not in Indiana either in pockets, uh, and not in pockets of Ohio. One thing about annual ryegrass is it's a high-risk, high-reward kind of cover crop. You've heard some things about it this morning already. It may be difficult to kill, but there's millions of acres that have been killed fairly effectively over the years. So uh, many varieties are, uh, will rarely live through the winter, so you've got to be careful what you're picking. But there's a whole lot of, a long list now of varieties that are winter hardy that'll do great. Probably the deepest and most fibrous root mass of any kind of scavenger that we're going to be able to find. We found roots over 70 inches deep on annual ryegrass in the past. Excellent scavenger of in as well. Uh, winter rye, we've talked about that, or cereal rye, whichever region you're in. Uh, it can get away from you. Uh, if your rye looks like that, you know, one thing about rye, it goes from this tall to this tall in about three hours. So you've got to be careful, or three rains, whichever it is. But nevertheless, point is, it can get away from you very quickly. And if you get rye that's that tall, that's been rolled, that's one option. The other option is sell it to a, you know, get it harvested off. So it can work really well with aerial application as well. And uh, we've seen some nice yield increase. A whole lot of other stuff is found at plantcovercrops.com. It's a website I've been working on for a number of years and got about 70,000 people around the world on that. So a whole lot of information there, and uh, when I get off the speaking route, we'll start getting new information on there as well.